When shall we three meet again? In thunder, lightning, or in rain? When the hurly-burly's done, when the battle's lost and won, that will be ere the set of sun. Where's the place? Upon the heath, there to meet with Macbeth. Fair. fair is foul, and foul is fair. Hover through the fog and the filthy air. What bloody man is that? He can report us seemeth by his plight of the revolt of the newest state. This is the sergeant, who like a good and hearty soldier fought against my captivity. Brave friend, take to the king the knowledge of the broil as thou dost leave it. Doubtful it stood, as two spent swimmers that do clean together and choke their art. The merciless MacDonwald, worthy to be a rebel, and for to that, the multiplying villainous nature do swarm upon him in fortune. On his damned quarrel smiled, showed like a rebel's whore. But all's too weak. For brave Macbeth, well he deserves that name, disdaining fortune with his brandished steel, which smoked with bloody execution like Valor's minion carved out his passage, till he faced a slave, which ne'er shook hands nor bade farewell to him, till he unseen him from the nave to the chops, and fixed his head upon our battlements. Oh, valiant cousin! Worthy gentlemen. Mark, King of Scotland, Mark. No sooner justice had with valor arm compelled these skipping kerns to trust their heels, but the Norwayan lord, surveying vantage with furbish arms, new supplies of men began a fresh assault. Uh, just made not this our captains, Macbeth and Banquo? Yes, as sparrows, eagles, are there the line. If I say sooth, I must report, there were his cannons overcharged with double cracks, so doubly redoubled strokes upon the foe, except they meant to bathe in Freaking wounds are memorizing of that gulk that I cannot tell. But I am faint. My gashes cry for help. Well, so well thy words become thee as thy wounds. They smack of honor both. Go, get him surgeons. Who comes here? The worthy thane of Ross. What a haste in his eyes. So he should speak that seems to speak things strange. God save the king. Whence camest thou, worthy thane? From Fife, great king. Where no way in Penners flout the sky and pan to our people cold. Norway. With terrible numbers, assisted by that most disloyal traitor, the Thane of Cawdor, began a dismal conflict, till that bold Macbeth confronted him with self-comparisons, point against point rebellious, arm against arm, curbing his lavish spirit, and to conclude, the victory fell on us. Oh, great happiness. Ah, no more that Thane of Cawdor shall deceive our bosom interests. Go. Pronounce his present death, and with his former title, Great Macbeth. I shall see it done. What he hath lost, noble Macbeth hath won.
hast thou been, sister? Killing swine. Sister, where thou? A sailor's wife had chestnuts in her lap and munched and munched and munched. Give me, quoth I. The right thee, witch, the rump fed Runyon cried. Her husband is to Aleppo gone. He's, he's master of the tiger. And thither in a sieve, I'll sail. And like a rat without a tail, I'll do, I'll do, and I'll do. <laughs> I'll give thee a win. Oh, thou art kind. <laughs> and I another. I myself have all the other. I'll drain him dry as hay. Sleep shall neither night nor day hang upon his penthouse lid. He shall live a man forbid. And though his bark cannot be lost, still it shall be tempest-tossed. Look what I have. Show me. Show me. Here I have a pilot's thumb, wrecked, as home would he did come. A drum, a drum, Macbeth doth come. The weird sisters hand in hand. Posters of the sea and land, thus do go about, about. thrice to thine, thrice, thrice to mine, thrice again to make up nine. Peace, the charms wound up. So foul and fair a day I have not seen. What are these, so withered and so wild in their attire, that look not like the inhabitants of the earth, and yet are on it? Live you, or you ought that men may question. You seem to understand me by each at once her chappy finger laying upon her skinny lips. Speak, if you can. What are you? Hail Macbeth, thane of Glamis. All hail Macbeth. Hail to thee, thane of Cawdor. All hail Macbeth. That shall be king hereafter. Good sir, why do you start and seem to fear things that do sound so fair? In the name of truth, are you fantastical, or that indeed which outwardly you show? My noble partner, you greet with present grace and great prediction, of noble having and a royal hope that he seems wrapped with all. To me you speak not. If you can look into the seeds of time and say which grain will grow and which will not, speak then to me. Neither begs nor fears your favors nor your hate. Hail. 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 Lesser than Macbeth and greater. Not so happy yet. Much happier. Thou shalt get kings, though thou be none. So all hail Macbeth and Banquo. Stay, you imperfect speakers, tell me more. By Sinnoh's death, I know I am Thane of Gloms. But how of Cawdor? The Thane of Cawdor lives, a prosperous gentleman. And to be king stands not within the prospect of belief no more than to be Cawdor. Say from whence you owe this strange intelligence, or why you stop us on our way with such prophetic greeting. Speak, I charge you. The earth has bubbles as the water has, and these are of them. Whither are they vanished? Into the air. What seems corporal melted his breath into the wind. Would they had stayed. Were such things here as we do speak about? Or have we eaten on the insane route that takes the reason prisoner? Your children shall be kings. You shall be king. <laughs> and thane of God or do, and do not so. <laughs> to the self-same tune in words. Who's here? The king has happily received Macbeth. The news of thy success. And when he reads thy personal ventures in the rebels' fight, his praises and his wonders do content which should be thine or his. Silence in that and viewing over the rest of the self-same day, he finds thee in the stouter way in ranks, nothing afeard of what thyself did make. Strange images of death, as thick as hail, post came with post, 
and, and every one did bear thy praises in his kingdom's great defense and poured them down before him. We have come to bring thee from our royal master thanks, only to herald thee into his sight, not to pay thee. And in the earnest of a greater honor, he bade me from him call thee Thane of Cawdor. And therefore, hail, most worthy Thane, for it is thine. What? Can the devil speak true? The Thane of Cawdor lives. Why do you dress me in borrowed robes? Who was the Thane of Cawdor lives yet, but under heavy judgment bears that life which he deserves to lose. Whether he was combined with those in Norway, or to blind the rebel with help and vantage, or that both of those lay in the same bed, I know not. The treason's capital respect and prove have overthrown him. Glom's and Thane of Cawdor. The greatest is behind. Thanks for your pains. Do you not hope your children shall be kings when those that gave the Thane of Cawdor to me promised no less to them? That trusted home might yet enkindle you into the crown besides the Thane of Cawdor. <laughs> but tis strange, for oftentimes to win us to our harm, the instruments of darkness tell us truths, win us with honest trifles, to betray us in deepest consequence. Cousins, a word I pray you. Two truths are told as happy prologues in the swelling act of the imperial theme. I thank thee, gentlemen. This supernatural soliciting cannot be ill, cannot be good. If ill, why hath it given me earnest of success commencing in a truth? I am Thane of Cawdor. If good, why do I yield to that suggestion whose horrid image doth unfix my hair and make my seated heart knock against my ribs? Against the use of nature. Pleasant fears are less than horrible imaginings. My thought, whose murder is yet but fantastic, will shake so my single state of man that function is smothered in surmise, and nothing is but what is not. If fate will have me king, what fate may crown me without my stir? Come what come may, time and the hour runs through the roughest day. Worthy Macbeth, we stay upon your leisure. <laughs> Give me your favor. My dull brain was wrought with things forgotten. Kind gentlemen, your pains are registered where every day I turn the leaf to read them. Let us toward the king. Think upon what has chanced. Not more time, the interim having waited, let us speak our free hearts each to other. Very gladly. So then enough. Come, friends. Is execution done on Cawdor? Are not those in commission yet returned? My liege, they are not yet come back. But I have spoke with one that saw him die, who did report that, very frankly, he confessed his treasons, implored your highness's pardon, and set forth a deep repentance. Nothing in his life became him like the leaving it. He died as one studied in death, to throw away the dearest thing he owed as twere a careless trifle. There's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. I he, he was a gentleman on whom I built an absolute trust. Worthiest cousin. Well, the sin of my ingratitude was even now heavy on me. Thou art so far before that swiftest wing of recompense is slow to overtake thee. Would thou hadst less deserved that the proportion both of thanks and payment might have been mine. The only I have left to say, more is thy due than more than all can pay. The service and loyalty I owe in doing it pays itself. Your Highness's part is to receive our duties. And our duties are to your throne and state, children and servants, which do but what they should, safe toward your love and honor. Uh, welcome hither. I have begun to plant thee and will labor to make thee full of growing. Noble Banquo, thou hast no less deserved nor nor must be known no less to have done so. Let me enfold thee and hold thee to my heart. There if I grow, the harvest is your own. My plenteous joys, wanton in fullness, seek to hide themselves in drops of sorrow. Sons, kinsmen, thanes, and you whose places are the nearest, know. We will establish our estate on our eldest Malcolm, whom we name hereafter the Prince of Cumberland, which honor must not 
unaccompanied invest him only, but signs of nobleness like stars shall shine on all deservers from hence to Inverness and bind us further to you. The rest is labor which is not used for you. I'll be myself the harbinger and make joyful the hearing of my wife at your approach. So humbly take my leave. My worthy Cador. Cumberland, this is a step on which I must fall down or else or leap, for in my way it lies. Stars, hide your fires. Let light not see my black and deep desires. The eye winks at the hand, yet let that be which the eye fears when done to see. True, worthy Banquo. He is full so valiant, and in his commendations I am fed. It is a banquet to me. Come, let's after him whose care has gone before to bid us welcome. It is a fearless kinsman. They met me in the day of success, and I have learned by the perpetuous report they have more in them than mortal knowledge. When I burned in desire to question them further, they made themselves air into which they vanished. While I stood wrapped in the wonder of it came missives from the king who all hailed me, Thane of Cawdor, by which title before these weird sisters saluted me and referred me to the coming on of time with, Hail King, that shalt be. This have I thought good to deliver thee, my dearest partner of greatness, that thou mightest not lose the dues of thy rejoicing by being ignorant of what greatness has promised thee. Lay it to thy heart and farewell. Glamus thou art, and Cawdor, and shalt be what thou art promised. And yet do I fear thy nature. It is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. Thou wouldst be great, art not without ambition, but without the illness should attend it. What thou wouldst highly, that wouldst thou holily. Wouldst not play false, and yet wouldst wrongly win. Hie thee hither, that I may pour my spirits in thine ear and chastise with the valor of my tongue all that impedes thee from the golden round, which fate and metaphysical aid doth seem to have thee crowned withal. What is your tidings? The king comes here tonight. Thou art mad to say it. Is not thy master with him, who were it so would have informed preparation? So please you, it is true. Our thane is coming. One of my fellows has the speed of him, who, almost dead for breath, had scarcely more than would make up his message. Give him tending. He brings great news. The raven himself is hoarse that croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. Come, you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here and fill me from the crown to the toe, top full of direst cruelty. Make thick my blood. Stop up the access and passage to remorse that no compunctious visitings of nature shake my fell purpose, nor keep peace between the effect and it. Come to my woman's breast and take my milk for gall, you murdering ministers. Wherever in your sightless substance you wait on nature's mischief. Come, thick night, and pall thee in the dunnest smoke of hell. That my keen knife see not the wound it makes, nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark to cry, hold, hold. Great Glamis. Worthy Cawdor, greater than both by the all hail hereafter. Thy letters have transported me beyond this ignorant present, and I feel now the future in the instant. My dearest love, Duncan comes here tonight. And when goes hence? Tomorrow, as he purposes. Oh, never shall sound that morrow see. Your face, my thane, is as a book where men may read strange matters. To beguile the time, look like the time. Bear welcome in your eye, 
your hand, your tongue, look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. He that's coming must be provided for, and you shall put this night's great business into my dispatch, which shall to all our nights and days to come give solely sovereign sway and masterdom. We'll speak further. Only look up clear, to alter favor ever is to fear. Leave all the rest to me. This castle hath a pleasant seat. Even in the damp air, it nimbly and sweetly recommends itself to our gentle senses. Uh, see, see our honored hostess. The love that follows us uh, sometime is our trouble, which still we thank as love. Herein I teach you how you shall bid God yield us for your pains and thank us for your trouble. All our service in every point twice done, and then done double, were poor and single business to contend with those honors deep and broad wherewith your majesty loads our house. For those of old and the late dignities heaped up to them, we rest your hermits. Well, where is the thane of Cawdor? We coursed him at the heels and had a purpose to be his purveyor, but he rides well, and his great love, sharp as his spur, hath helped him to his home before us. Fair and noble hostess, we are your guests tonight. Your servants ever have theirs, themselves, and what is theirs in comps to make their audit at your highness's pleasure, still to return your own. Give me thy hand and conduct me to mine host. We love him highly and shall continue our graces towards him. By your leave, hostess. If it were done when tis done, then to well it were done quickly. The assassination could trammel up the consequence and catch with his surcease success. But that this blow might be the be all and the end all here. But here, on this bank and shoal of time, we jump the life to come. But in these cases, we still have judgment here. Do we but teach bloody instruction, which being taught returns to plague the inventor? This even handed justice commends the ingredients of our poison chalice to our lips. It is here in double trust. First, that I am his kinsman and his subject, strong both against the deed. Then, that his host should against his murderer slam the door, not bear the knife myself. Besides, this Duncan hath borne his faculty so meek, has been so clear in his great office, that his virtue should plead like angels, trumpet-tongued against the deep damnation of his taking off. And pity, like a naked newborn babe striding the blast, who heaven's cherubim, Horsed upon the sightless couriers of the air, should blow this horrid deed in every eye, that tears shall drown the wind. I have no spurs to prick the sides of my intent, only vaulting ambition which o'erleaps itself and falls on the other. How now? What news? He has almost supped. Why have you left the chamber? Hath he asked for me? Know you not, he hath? I will proceed no further in this business. He hath honored me of late, and I bought golden opinions from all sorts of people which should be worn now in their newest gloss, not cast aside so soon. Was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? Hath it slept since, and wakes it now to look so green and pale at what it did so freely? From this time, such I account thy love. Art thou afeard to be the same in thine own act and valor as thou art in desire? 
wouldst thou have that which thou esteemest the ornament of life, and live a coward in thine own esteem, letting I dare not wait upon I would, like the poor cat in the attic. Prithee, peace. I dare do all that may become a man. Who dares do more is none. What beast was it then that made you break this enterprise to me? When you durst do it, then you were a man. And to be more than what you were, you would be so much more the man. Nor time nor place did then at here, and yet you would make both. They have made themselves. And that their fitness now does unmake you. I have given suck, and know how tender tis to love the babe that milks me. I would, while it was smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out. Had I so sworn as you have done to this? We should fail. We fail! But screw your courage to the sticking place and will not fail. When Duncan is asleep, where to the rather shall his day's hard journey soundly invite him? His two chamberlains will I with wine and wassail so convince that memory, the warder of the brain, shall be a fume, and the receipt of reason a limbeck only. When in swinish sleeps their drenched natures lies as in a death, what cannot you and I perform upon the unguarded Duncan? What not put upon his spongy officers? We shall bear the guilt of our great quell. Bring forth men, children only, for thy undaunted metal shall compose nothing but males. Will it not be received when we have marked with blood those sleepy two of his own chamber and used their daggers that they have done it? Who dares receive it otherwise, as we shall make our grief and clamor roar upon his death? I'm settled, and bend up each corporal agent to this terrible feat away. And mock time with fairest show. False face must hide what the false heart doth know. How goes the night, boy? The moon is down, I have not heard the clock. And she goes down at twelve. I take it this later is first. Hold, take my sword. There's husbandry in heaven, their candles are all out. Take thee that too. A heavy summons lies like lead upon me, and yet I would not sleep. Merciful powers restraining me the cursed thoughts that nature gives way to in repose. Give me my sword, who's there? A friend. <laughs> what, sir? Not yet at rest? The king's of bed. He hath been an unusual pleasure and sent forth great largesse to your offices. This diamond he greets your wife withal, by name of most kind hostess, and shut up in measureless content. Being unprepared, our will became the servant to defect, which else should free have wrought. All's well. I dreamt last night of the three weird sisters. To you they have shown some truth. I think not of them. But when we can entreat some words, we should spend it in some time upon that business, if you'd grant it. At your kindest leisure. If you'll cleave to my consent when tis, it shall make honor for you. So I lose none in seeking to augment it, but still keep my bosom franchised and my legions clear. I shall be counseled. Good repose the while. Thanks, sir. The like to you. Go. Bid thy mistress, when my drink is ready, to strike upon the bell. Get thee to bed. Is the dagger which I see before me, the handle toward my hand? Come, let me clutch thee. Have thee not, and yet I see thee still. Art thou not, fatal vision, as sensible to feeling as to sight? Or art thou but a dagger of the mind, a false creation proceeding from the heat oppressed brain? I see thee yet, and such an instrument I was to use. Thou marshalst me the way I was going. My eyes are made fools of the other senses. Or else worth all the rest. I see thee still. 
and on thy blade and dudgeon gouts of blood, which was not so before. There's no such thing. It's that bloody business which informs thus to mine eyes. Now for the one half world nature seems dead. Wicked dreams abuse the curtain sleep. Witchcraft celebrates pale Hecate's offerings and withered murder alarmed by his sentinel, the wolf, whose howls his watch. And thus, with his stealthy pace, with Tarquin's ravishing strides towards his design, he moves like a ghost. Thou sure and firm set earth, hear not my steps which way they walk, for fear thy very stones prey to my whereabouts, and take the present horror from the time which now suits with it. Was I threat? He lives. Words to the heat of deed too cold breath gives. I go, and it is done. The bell invites me. Hear it not, Duncan, for it is a knell which summons me to heaven or to hell. That which hath made them drunk hath made me bold. What hath quenched them hath given me fire. Hark! Peace. It was the owl that shrieked. The fatal bellman which gives the sternest good night. He is about it. The doors are open, and the surfeited grooms do mock their charge with snores. I have drugged their possets, that nature and death do contend about them whether they live or die. What? Ho! Oh. Alack! I'm afraid they have awaked and tis not done. The attempt and not the deed confounds us. Hark! I laid their daggers ready. He could not miss them. Had he not resembled my father as he slept, I had done it. My husband. <laughs> I've done the deed. Just saw not hear a noise. I heard the owl scream and the crickets cry. Did not you speak? When? Now. As I descended? I. Hark. Who lies in the second chamber? Donald Bain. Oh, it is a sorry sight. It's a foolish thought to say a sorry sight. If one did laugh in his sleep, and one cried murder, if they did wake each other, I stood and heard them. They said the prayers and addressed them again to sleep. There are two lodged together. One said, God bless us, and amen the other, as they had seen me with these hangmen's hands. Listening their fear, I could not say amen when they did say, God bless us. Consider it not so deeply. For wherefore could I not pronounce amen? I had much need of blessing, and amen stuck in my throat. These madams must not be thought after these ways, so it will make us mad. Methought I heard a voice say, sleep no more. Macbeth does murder sleep. Innocent sleep. Sleep that knits up the raveled sleeve of care. Death to each day's life. Sore labor's bath. Balm of hurt minds. Great nature's second course and chief nourisher of life's feast. What do you mean? 
still it cried, sleep no more to all the house. Gloms has murdered sleep, and therefore Condor shall sleep no more. Macbeth shall sleep no more. Was it that thus cried? <sighs> My worthy thing, you do unbend your noble strength to think so brain sickly of things. Go get some water and wash this filthy witness from your hand. Why did you bring these daggers from the place? They must lie there. Go carry them and smear the sleepy grooms with blood. Oh, go no more. I'm afraid to think of what I've done. Look on it again, I dare not. Infirm of purpose, give me the daggers. The sleeping and the dead are but as pictures. Tis the eye of childhood that fears a painted devil. If he do bleed, I'll gild the faces of the grooms with all, for it must seem their guilt. Is that knocking? How is it with me when every noise appalls me? What hands are these? <laughs> they pluck out mine eyes. <laughs> Will all great Neptune's ocean wash this blood clean from my hand? No, this my hand, or rather the multitudinous seas in Cardadine, turning the green one. Red. My hands are of your color, though I shame to wear a heart so white. I hear knocking at the south entry. Retire we to our chamber. A little water clears us of this deed. How easy is it then? Your constancy hath left you unattended. Hark, more knocking. Get on your nightgown, lest occasion should call us and show us to be watchers. Be not lost so poorly in your thoughts. To know my deed, to best not know myself. Wake, Duncan, with thy knocking! I would thou couldst! Here's a knocking indeed. Oh, if a man were porter of Hellgate, he should grow old, turn him the key. Knock, knock, knock. Who's there in the name of Beelzebub? Here's a farmer that hanged himself on the expectation of plenty. Ah, uh, come in time, but have napkins enough about you. Here you'll sweat for it. Knock, knock, who's there in the other devil's name? Faith, here's an equivocator that could swear in both the scales against either scale, who committed treason enough for God's sake, yet could not equivocate to heaven. Oh, come in, equivocator. Bow, never at quiet. What are you? Ah, but this place is too cold for hell. I'll devil portrait no further. I had thought to have let in some of all professions that go the primrose way to the everlasting bonfire. Anon, anon! Ah, I pray you. Remember the porter. Ah. Was it so late, friend? Ere you went to bed, that you do lie so late. Faith, sir, we were carousing till the uh, second cock, and drink, sir, is a great provoker of mm, three things. <laughs> what three things does drink especially provoke? Mary, sir. Nose painting, sleep, and urine. Lechery, sir, it provokes and unprovokes. It provokes the desire, but it takes away the performance. Therefore, much drink may be said to be an equivocator with lechery. 
It makes him and admires him. It sets him on and it takes him off. It uh, persuades him and disheartens him. In conclusion, equivocates him in a sleep and giving him the lie, leaves him. I believe drink gave thee the lie last night. Ha <laughs> ha, that it did, sir, in the very throat on me, but I requited him for his lie. And I think being too strong for him, though he did took up my legs sometimes, yet I made a shift to cast him. <laughs> Is thy master stirring? Oh, knocking has awaked him. Here he comes. Good morrow, noble sir. Good morrow, both. Is the king stirring, worthy thane? Not yet. Yeah. He did command me to call timely on him. I've almost slipped the hour. I'll bring you to him. I know this is a joyful trouble to you, but yet tis what? Ah, uh, the labor we delight in, said the king. There's the door. I'll make so bold to call, for tis my limited service. Goes the king hence today? He does. He did appoint so. Night has been unruly. From where we lay, the chimneys were blown down. And as they say, lamentings were heard in the air, strange screams of death, and prophesying with dire accents terrible of combustion, and confusing events new hatched to the woeful time. The obscure bird clamored the livelong night, and some say the earth was feverous and did shake. Twas a rough night. My young remembrance cannot parallel a fellow to it. Oh, horror, 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 tongue nor heart cannot conceive nor name thee. What's the matter? What's the matter? Confusion now hath made his masterpiece. Most sacrilegious murder hath broke up the Lord's anointed temple and stole thence the life of the building. What is it you say, the light? Mean you his majesty? Approach the chamber and destroy your sight with a new gorgon. Do not bid me speak, but see, and then speak yourselves. Awake! Awake! Ring the alarm bell! Murder and treason! Banquo and Donalbane! Malcolm, awake! Shake off this downy sleep that's counterfeit and look on death itself! Up! Up and see the great doom's image! Malcolm, Banquo, as from your graves, Rise up and walk like sprites to countenance this horror. Ring the bell. What's the business that such a hideous trumpet calls to parlay the sleepers of the house? Speak, oh, speak. gentle lady, it is not for you to hear what I can speak. The repetition in a woman's ear would murder as it fell. Oh, Banquo, Banquo, our royal master is murdered. Whoa, alas, what? In our house? Too cruel cool anywhere. Dear Duff, I prithee contradict thyself and say it is not so. Had I but died an hour before this chance, I'd live to bless the time. But from this instant, nothing serious in mortality, all is but toys. Renown and grace is dead. The wine of life has been drawn, and the mere lees are left the vault to brag of. What is amiss? You are, and do not know it. Spring. The head, the fountain of your blood is stopped. The very source of it is stopped. Your royal father's murdered. Oh, by whom? Those of his chambers seem to have done it. Their faces and hands were all badged with blood. Even their daggers, which found unwiped upon their pillows, stared and were distracted. No man's life was to be trusted with them. Oh, but I do repent me of my fury that I did kill them. Wherefore did you so? Who can be wise, amazed? Temperate and furious, loyal and neutral in an instant. No man. The expedition, my violent love, outrun the pause or reason. Here lay Duncan, his silver skin laced with his golden blood. His gasp stabs look like a breach in nature for ruin's wasteful entrance. There, the murderers, steeped in the colors of their trade their daggers unmannerly breached with gore. Who could refrain? Who had a heart to love, and with that heart, courage to make loves known? Look to the lady. Why do we hold our tongues that most may claim this argument for ours? What should be spoken here where our fate hidden in an auger hole may rush out and seize us? Let's away. Our tears are not yet brewed, nor our strong sorrow set upon the foot of motion. Look to the lady. And when we have our naked frailties hid that suffer and exposure, 
Let us meet and question this most bloody piece of work to know it further. Fears and scruples shake us. In the great hand of God I stand, and thence against the undivulged pretense I fight of treasonous malice. And so do I. So all. Let us briefly put on manly readiness and meet together in the hall. Well contented. What will you do? Let's not consort with them. To show unfelt sorrow is an office which a false man does easy. I'll to England. To Ireland, I. Our separated fortune shall keep us both the safer. Where we are, there's daggers in men's smiles. The near in blood, the near bloody. This murderous shaft that shot has not yet lighted. And our safest way is to avoid the aim. Therefore, to horse. And let's not be dainty of leave taking, but shift away. There's warrant in the theft that steals itself when there's no mercy left. Three score and ten. I can remember well. During the volume of which time I have seen hours dreadful and things strange. But this sore night hath trifled former knowings. Ah, good father, thou seest the heavens as troubled as man's act, threaten his bloody stage. By the clock tis day, and yet dark night strangles the traveling lamp. Is it night's predominance? Or days shame that darkness does the face of earth and tomb when living light should kiss it. Tis unnatural, even like the deed that's done. On Tuesday last, a falcon towering in her pride of place was by a mousing owl hawked at and killed. And Duncan's horses, thing most strange and certain, turned wild in nature, broke out their stalls, flung out, contending against obedience as they would make war against mankind. She said they ate each other. And so they did. Oh. To the amazement of my eyes, I looked upon it. Ah, here comes good Macduff. How goes the world, sir, now? Why, see you not? Is it known who did this more than bloody deed? Those that Macbeth hath slain. Alas, the day. What good could they pretend? They were suborned. Malcolm and Donald Bain, the king's two sons, are stolen away and fled, which puts upon them suspicion of the deed. Against nature still, thriftless ambition that will raven up thine own life's means. Then, tis most certain, the sovereignty will fall upon Macbeth. He is already named, and gone to Schoon to be invested. Where is Duncan's body? Carried to Colmkill, the sacred storehouse of his predecessors, and guardian of their bones. Will you to Schoon? No, cousin, I'll to fight. Well, I will thither. Well, may you see things well done there. Adieu, lest our old robes sit easier than our new. Farewell, father. God's venison go with you, and with all those that make good of bad and friends of foes. Thou hast it now, King, Cardor, Glamis all, and I fear thou playest most foully for it. Yet it was said it should not stand in thy posterity, but that myself should be the root and father of many kings. If there come truth from them as upon thee, Macbeth, their speeches shine. Why, by the verities on thee make good, may they not be my oracles as well, and set me up in hope? But hush, no more. Here's our chief guest. If he had been forgot, it had been as a gap in our great feast, an all thing unbecoming. Tonight we hold a solemn supper, sir, and I will require your presence. Let your highness command upon me to the which my duties are with a most indissoluble tie forever knit. Ride you this afternoon? Aye, my good lord. We would else would have desired your good advice at this day's council, but we'll take tomorrow. Is it far you ride? As far, my lord, as will fill the time twixt this and supper. Go not my horse the better, 
I must become a borrower of the night for a dark hour or twain. Fail not our feast. My lord, I will not. <laughs> we hear our bloody cousins are bestowed in England and in Ireland, not confessing their cruel parricide and filling their hearers with strange invention. But of that tomorrow, and therewithal we have cause of state craving us jointly. Hie you to a horse. Adieu, till you return at night. Goes Leont with you? Aye, my lord. Our time does call upon us. Then I wish your horses swift and sure of foot, and so I commend you to their backs. Farewell. Let every man be master of his time till seven at night. To make society the sweeter welcome, we will keep ourselves till supper time alone. Well then, I, uh, God be with you. Here are, a word with you. Attend those men our pleasure. They are, my lord, without the palace gate. Bring them before us. To be thus is nothing. But to be safely thus, our fears and Banquo stick deep. And in his royalty of nature reigns that which would be feared. Tis much he dares. And to that dauntless temper of his mind, he hath a wisdom that doth guide his valor to act in safety. There's none but he whose being I do fear. And under him, my genius is rebuked, as it is said Mark Antony's was by Caesar. He chid the sisters when first they put the name of king upon me and bade them speak to him. Then, prophet-like, he hailed them, they hailed him father to a line of kings. Upon my head, they placed a fruitless crown and put a barren scepter in my grip, no son of mine succeeding. If it be so, for Banquo's issue have I defiled my mind. For them, the gracious Duncan, have I murdered, put rancors in the vessels of my peace only for them, and mine eternal jewel given to the common enemy of man to make them kings, the seed of Banquo kings. Rather than so, come fate into the list and champion me to the Rodderwins. Who's here? Go to the door, wait till we call. Was it not yesterday we spoke together? It was, so please, your highness. Well then, have you considered of my speeches? Know you that it was he in times past which kept you so under fortune, which you thought had been our innocent self? This I made good to you at our last conference, past in probation, how you were born in hand, how crossed, the instrument who wrought with him, and all things else that might, a half a soul a notion praised, say, thus did Banquo. You made it known to us. I did so, and went further, which is the point of our second meeting. Do you find your patience so predominant in your nature that you can let this go? Are you so gospeled to pray for this good man and for his issue, whose heavy hand hath bowed you to the grave and beggared yours forever? We are men, my liege. Aye, and in the catalog ye go for men, as greyhounds, hounds, mongrels, spaniels, curs, shows, water rugs, and demi wolves are clept all in the name of dogs. The valued file distinguishes the swift, the slow, the subtle, the housekeeper, the hunter, every one according to the gift that bounteous nature hath in him clothed which he does receive particular addition in the bill that writes them all alike. So of men. Now, if you have a station in the file, not in the worst rank of manhood, say it. And I'll put that business into your bosom whose execution takes your enemy off, grappling you to the heart and love of us, who wears our health but sickly in his life, which in his death, were perfect. I am one, my liege, whom the vile blows and buffets of the world had so incensed that I'm reckless what I do to fight the world. <laughs> and I another, so weary with disasters, tugged with misfortune that I would set my life on any chance to mend it 
or be rid of it. Both of you know that Banquo is your enemy. True, my lord. My lord. So is he mine. And in such bloody distance that every minute of his being thrust against my nearest of life. And though I could, with bare-faced power, sweep him from my sight and bid my will about it, yet I must not. For certain friends that are both his and mine, whose loves I may not drop, would wail his fall that I myself struck down. And thence it is that I to your assistance do make love, disguising the purpose from the common eye for sundry weighty reasons. We shall, my lord, perform what you command us. Though our lives- Your spirits shine through you. Within this hour at most, I will advise you where to plant yourself. Acquaint you with the perfect spy of the time, the moment on it, for it must be done tonight. And something from the palace always thought I required a clearness. And with him, leave no rubs or botches in the work. Leonce, his son, who keeps him company, whose absence is no less material to me than of his father's. He must embrace the fate of that dark hour. Resolve yourselves apart. I'll come to you anon. We are resolved, my lord. <laughs> my lord. I'll call upon you straight. Abide within. <laughs> It is concluded. Banquo, your soul's flight, if it finds heaven, must find it tonight. Is Banquo gone from court? Aye, madam, but returns again tonight. Say to the king I would attend his leisure for a few words. Madam, I will. Not had, all spent, where our desire is got without content. It is safer to be that which we destroy than by destruction dwell in doubtful joy. How now, my lord? Why do you keep alone? Of sorriest fancies your companions making, using those thoughts which should indeed have died with them they think on. Things without all remedy should be without regard. What's done is done. We have scorched the snake, not killed it. She'll close and be herself as our poor malice remains in danger of her former tooth. Let the frame of things disjoint. Both the worlds suffer. Ere we will eat our meal in fear and sleep in the afflictions of the terrible dreams that shake us nightly. Better be with the dead. And we, to gain our peace, have sent to peace than the torture of the mind to lie in restless ecstasy. Duncan is in his grave. After life's fitful fever, he sleeps well. Treason has done his worst, nor steel, nor poison, malice, domestic, foreign levy, nothing can touch him further. Come on. Gent, my lord, sleep o'er your rugged looks. Be bright and jovial among your guests tonight. So shall I, love. And so I pray be you. Let your remembrance apply to Banquo. Present him eminence, both with eye and tongue, unsafe the while. But we must lathe our honors in these flattering screens, and make our faces wizards of our hearts, disguising what they are. You must leave this. Full of scorpions is my mind, dear wife. Thou knowest that Banquo and his fleance lives. But in them, nature's copy's not a turn. <laughs> There's comfort yet. They're assailable. And be thou jocund, ere the bath hath flown his cloistered flight, ere to black Hecate summons the shard-born beetle, with his drowsy hums hath rung night's yawning peal. There shall be done a deed of dreadful note. What's to be done? Be innocent of the knowledge, dearest one, to thou applaud the deed. Come, sealing night, and scarf up the tender eye of pitiful day. And with thy bloody and invisible hands, cancel and tear to pieces that great bond which keeps me pale.
the light thickens, and the crow makes wing to the rookie wood. Good things of day begin to droop and drowse, as night's black agents to their prey do rouse. Thou marvelst at my words, yet hold thee still. Things bad begun make strong themselves by ill. Prithee, come with me. But who did bid thee join with us? Macbeth. He needs not our mistrust, since he deals our offices and what we have to do to the direction just. Then stand with us. The west yet glimmers with some streaks of day, and now spurs the lated traveler apace to gain the timely inn, and near approaches the subject of our watch. Hark, I hear horses. Give us the light there. Ho. Oh. Then tis he, the rest that are within the note of expectation, already writ the court. His horses go about. Almost a mile. But he does usually, so all men do, from hence to the palace gate make it their walk. A light, a light. Tis he. Send to it. It will be rain tonight. Let it come down. Oh, treacherous! Uh, like uh, a bird! Uh, <laughs> Who did strike out the light? Was it not the way? There's but one down. The sun is fled. Uh, We've lost uh, best half our affair. Well, let's away and say how much is done. And last, the hearty welcome. Thanks to your majesty. Our self will mingle with society and play the humble host. Our hostess keeps her state, but in best time, we will require her welcome. Pronounce it for me, sir, to all our friends, for my heart speaks they are welcome. See, they encounter thee with their hearts, thanks. Both sides are even. Here I'll sit in the midst, be large in mirth, and anon we'll drink a measure of the table round. There's blood on thy face. Tis Banquo's then. Better be without than he within. Is he dispatched? Ay, my lord. His throat is cut. That I did for him. Thou art the best of the cutthroats. Yet he's good that did the like for Fleance. If thou didst it, thou art the non parel. Most royal, sir. Fleance escaped. Then comes my fit again. Hide else been perfect. As whole as the marble, as founded as the rock. As broad and general as the casing air. Now I'm cabined, cribbed, confined, bound in by saucy doubts and fears. But Benko is safe. Aye, my good lord, safe in a ditch he bides, <laughs> with twenty trenched gashes on his head, the least a death to nature. 
Thanks for that. There the grown serpent lies. The worm that's fled, it's nature that in time will venom breed. So no teeth for the present. Get thee gone. Tomorrow we'll hear ourselves again. My royal lord, you do not give the cheer. <laughs> Sweet remembrancer. Now, good digestion waits on appetite and health on both. <laughs> May it please your highness, sit. Here had we now our country's honor root, with the graced person of our Banquo present. Whom may I rather challenge an unkindness than pity and mischance? His absence, sir, lays blame upon his promise. Please that your highness to grace us with your royal company. The table's full. Here, sir, a place reserved. Where? Here, sir. What is it that moves your highness? Which of you have done this? What do you mean, my lord? Thou canst not say I did it. Never shake thy gory locks in me. Uh, gentlemen, rise. His highness is not well. Sit. Worthy friends. My lord is often thus and hath been from his youth. Pray you, keep seat. The fit is momentary. Upon a thought he will again be well. If much you note him, you shall offend him and extend his passion. Feed and regard him not. Are you a man? Hide in the bold one that there's look on that which might appall the devil. Oh, proper stuff. This is the very painting of your fear. This is the air drawn dagger which you said led you to Duncan. Oh, these flaws and starts, impostors to true fear, would well become a woman's story at a winter's fire, authorized by her grandam. Shame itself. Why do you make such faces? When all's done, you look but on a stool. Prithee, see there. Behold, look. Lo, how say you? By what care I? If thou canst nod, speak too. If charnel houses in our graves must send those we bury back, our monument shall be the maws of kites. What? Quite unmanned in folly. If I stand here, I did see him. I, for shame. Blood has been shed here now. In the olden times, as a human statute purged the gentle wheel, I, and since too, murders have been performed too terrible for the ear. The time has been, when the brain was out, the man would die, and thus an end. Now they rise again with twenty mortal murders on their crowns and push us from our stools. It's more strange than such a murder is. My worthy lord, your noble friends do lack me. I do forget. Do not muse at me, most worthy friends. I have a strange infirmity which is nothing to those that know me. Come, love and health to all. Here, I'll sit down. Bring some wine. Fill full. I drink to the general joy of the whole table, and to our dear friend Banquo, whom we miss, would he were here. To all, and to him we thirst, and all to all. Our duties and the pledge. <laughs> Faunted, quit my sight! Let the earth hide thee! The bone from Erilus, thy blood is cold. There is no speculation in those eyes which thou dost glare with. Think of this good Pierce, but as a thing of custom. Tis no other, only it spoils the pleasure of the time. What man dare I dare? Approach thou like a rugged Russian bear, the armed rhinoceros, the hearken tiger, take any shape but that, and my firm nerves shall never tremble. It would be alive again. Condemn me to the desert with thy sword. The trembling I inhabit then, protest me, the baby of a girl. This horrible shadow hits, unreal mockery hits. Why, so being gone, I am a man again. Prithee, sit still. You have displaced the mirth, broke the good meeting with most admired disorder. Can such things be, and overcome us like a summer's cloud without our special wonder? 
you make me strange, even to the disposition that I owe when I think you can behold such sights and keep the natural ruby of your cheeks was mine or pledge to fear. What sights, my lord? I pray you speak not. He grows worse and worse. Question enrages him at once. Good night. Stand not upon the order of your going, but go at once. Good night. And may better health attend his majesty. A kind good night to all. Who love blood? They say blood will have blood. Stones have been known to move and trees to speak. Augers and understood relations have by magpies and chuffs and rooks brought forth the secretest man of blood. What is the night? Almost at odds with morning, which is which. How say you that the duff denies his person at our great bidding? Did you send to him, sir? I hear it, by the way, but I shall send. There's not a one of them, but in his house I keep a servant feed. I will tomorrow, and by times I will to the weird sisters. More shall they speak. For now I'm bent to know by the worst means the worst. For mine own good, all causes must give way. I'm in blood stepped in so far that should I wade no more, returning were as tedious as galore. Oh, strange things I have in head, the rule to hand, which must be acted ere they may be scarce. You lack the season of all natures, sleep. Come, go to sleep. As strange and self-abuse is the initiate fear which wants hard use. We're yet but young indeed. Thrice the brinded cat hath mewed, thrice, and once the hedgehog whined. The harpier cries, tis time, tis time. Round about the cauldron go, in the poisoned entrails throw. Toad, that under cold stone days and nights has thirty-one sweltered venom sleeping got. Boil thou first in the charmed pot. Double, 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 double toil, toil and trouble. Fire, fire burn and, and cauldron, cauldron bubble. bubble. Fillets of a fenny snake in the cauldron boil and bake. Eye of newt and toe of frog. Mm. Wool of bat and tongue of dog. Adder's fork and blind worm sting. Lizard's leg and owlet's wing. For a charm of powerful trouble. Like a hell broth boil and Bubble. Double, 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 toil and trouble, fire burn and cold bubble. Scale of dragon 
two of wolf, which is mummy, ma, and go of the ravened salt sea shark, a root of hemlock digged in the dark. Liver of a blaspheming Jew, gall of goat, and slips of you silvered in the moon's eclipse. Nose of Turk and Tartar's lips. Finger of a birth strangled babe. Ditch delivered by a drab, make the gruel sick and slab. Double, 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 double toil and trouble. Fire burn and cauldron bubble. Cool it with the baboon's blood. And then the charm is firm and good by the pricking of my thumbs something wicked this way comes open locks whoever knocks how now you secret black and midnight hags what is it you do a deed, a deed without, without a, name. a name. I conjure you by that which you profess. However you come to know it, answer me. Though you untie the winds and let them fight against the churches, though the yeasty waves confound and swallow navigation up, though bladed corn be lodged and trees blown down, though castles topple on their warders' heads, though palaces and pyramids who slope their heads to their foundations, though the treasures of nature's Germans tumble all together, even till destruction sicken. Answer me to what I ask you. Speak. Demand. Will answer. Or say, if thou'd rather hear it from our lips or uh, from our masters. Call them. Let me see them. Pour in sow's blood that have eaten her nine pharaoh. Grease that sweated from a murderer's gibbet, throw into the flame. Come, Come high or low, low thyself and, and office deftly show. Tell me, thou unknown power. Oh, he knows thy thought. Hear his speech, say thou not. Macbeth, Macbeth, Macbeth. Beware, Macduff. Beware the Thane of Fife. Dismiss me. Enough. Whatever thou art, for thy good caution, thanks, for thou hast harped my fear aright. For one word more. Uh huh. He'll not be commanded. Here's another more potent than the first. Macbeth! 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 Had I three ears, I'd hear thee. Be bloody, bold, and resolute. Laugh to scorn. Scorn the power of man, for none of woman born shall harm Macbeth. Then live, Macduff. What need I fear of thee? But yet I'll make assurance double sure, and take a bond of faith. Thou shalt not live, for I may tell pale-hearted fear it lies, and sleep in spite of thunder. What is this? It rises like the issue of a king and wears on its baby brow the round and top of sovereignty. Listen, Listen but, but speak, speak not, not to it. it. Be lion metal, 
proud. And take no heed who chafes, who frets, or where conspirers are. Macbeth shall never vanquished be until great Burnham Wood to high Dunsinane Hill shall come against him. Thou shalt not be. For who can press the forest, bid the earth unfix its earthbound root? Oh, sweet Bodeman's good. Rebellion's head rise never to the wood of Burnham rise. In high placed Macbeth shall live the lease of nature and pay his breath till time and mortal custom. Yet my heart throbs to know one thing. Tell me. If thou art, can tell so much. Shall Banquo's issue ever reign in this kingdom? Seek to, to know, know no, no more. more. I will be satisfied. Deny me this, and an eternal curse shall fall upon thee. Tell me. What noise is this? Show. 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 Thou art too, like the spirit of Banquo. Down! Thy crown to sear mine eyeballs, and thy hair, that other gold-bound brow was like the first. The former is like the third. Filthy hags, why do you show me this? The fourth. Oh, start eyes, what will this line stretch on to the crack of doom? Another yet, the seventh, I'll see no more. And yet the eighth approaches, who bears a glass which shows me many more. Oh, horrible sight! Now I know it is true. The blood boltered Banquo smiles at me and shows them for his. What is it so? <laughs> what are they gone? At this pernicious hour, send I curse it in the calendar. Come in without there. What's your greatest will? Saw the other weird sisters. No, my good lord. Came they not by you? No, indeed, my good lord. Reflected be the air whereon they ride. And damned all those that trust them. Yet I did hear a horse gallop. Who was it that came by? Tis two or three that bring word. Macduff has fled to England. Fled to England? Aye, my good lord. Time, thou anticipates my dread exploits. From this moment, the very firstlings of my heart shall be the firstlings of my hand. And even so, to crown my thoughts with acts, be it thought and done. The castle of Macduff shall I surprise, seize upon fife, and put to the edge of the blade his wife, his babes, and all unfortunate souls that claim him in his line. No more boasting like a fool. This deed I'll do before this purpose cool. No more sights. Where are the gentlemen? Come take me where they are. Thank you.
My former speeches have a hitch with thoughts which can't interpret further. But I must say, things have been strangely born. The gracious Duncan was pitied of Macbeth. Mary, he was dead. And the great valiant Banquo walked too late. Whom you may say, if it please you, Fleance killed. For Fleance fled, <laughs> men must not walk too late. And who cannot want the thought how monstrous it was for Malcolm and for Donalbane to kill their gracious father? A damned fact! How it did grieve Macbeth! Did he not in pious rage the two delinquents tear who were slaves of drink and thralls of sleep? Was not that nobly done? <laughs> Aye, and wisely too. For it would have angered any heart alive to hear the men deny it. So, I must say, he has borne things well. And I think had he Duncan's sons under his key, and as it please heaven he should not, they would know what it were to kill a father. That should flee on. But peace, for from broad words and cause, he has failed the tyrant's feast. I hear Macduff lives in disgrace. Sir, will you tell me where he bestows himself? The son of Duncan, from whom this tyrant holds the due of birth, lives in the English court and has received the most pious Edward. Thither Macduff has gone to pray the holy king, upon his aid to wake Northumberland and warlike seaward, that with the aid of these, with him above to ratify the world, we may once more give to our tables meat, sleep to our nights, free from our feasts and banquets bloody knives, all which we pine for now. And this report had so exasperate the king that he prepares for some attempted war. Sent he to Macduff? He did, and with an absolute, sir, not I, the cloudy messenger turns his back away. That may well advise him to a caution. Hold some distance his wisdom can provide. May some holy angel fly to that court in England and unfold his message ere he come. That a swift blessing return to this our suffering country under a hand accursed. I'll send my prayers with him. What had he done to make him fly the land? You must have patience, madam. He had none. His flight was madness. You do when not... our actions do not, our fears do make us traitors. You do not know whether it was his wisdom or his fear. Wisdom? To leave his wife, to leave his babes, his mansion and his titles in a place from whence himself does fly? He loves us not. He wants the natural touch. For the poor wren, the most diminutive of birds, will fight her young ones in her nest against the owl. All is the fear and nothing is the love. As little is the wisdom or the flight so runs against all reason. My dearest cuz, I pray you school yourself. For your husband, he is noble, wise, judicious, and best knows the fits of the seasons. I dare not speak much further. For cruel are the times when we are traitors and we know not ourselves, when we hold room of what we fear, yet know not what we fear but float upon a wild and violet sea each way and none. I shall take my leave of you. Shall not be gone long, but I'll be back again. Things at the worst will cease or else rise upward to what they were before. My pretty cuz, blessings on you. Fathered he is, and yet he's fatherless. I am so much a fool should I remain any longer. It would be to my disgrace and your discomfort. I take my leave at once. Sarah, your father is dead. And what will you do now? How will you live? As birds do, mother. <laughs> what? With worms and flies? With what I get, I mean, and so do they. My father is not dead, Friar Singh. If you were dead, you would weep from it. If not, it were a good sign that you should quickly have a new father. <laughs> Poor prattler, how thou talkest! <laughs> Trust you, fair dame. I am not to you known, though in your state of honor I am perfect. I fear some danger does approach you nearly. If you would take a homely one's advice, be not found here. Hence, with your little ones. To fright you thus, methinks I am too savage. To do worse to you, were fell cruelty, which is too nigh your person. Heaven preserve you. I dare abide no longer.
whither should I fly? I have done no harm. But I remember now I am in this earthly world where to do harm is often laudable. To do good sometimes accounted dangerous folly. Why then, alas, do I put up that womanly defense to say I have done no harm? What are these faces? Where is your husband? I, I hope in no place so unsanctified where such as thou mayest find him. He is a traitor! The lies! What, you <gasps> egg! <laughs> Young dry of treachery! He has killed me, mother! Run away! <laughs> no, please! <laughs> no! Let us pick out some desolate shade, and there weep our sad bosoms empty. Let us rather hold fast the mortal sword, and like good men bestride our downfall and birth them. Each new day, new widows howl, new orphans cry, new sorrows strike heaven on the face, that it resounds as if it felt with Scotland, and yelled out like syllable of dolor. What I believe, I'll wail. What no, believe. And what I can redress, as I shall the time to find friend, I will. That what you say, it may be so, perchance. The tyrant, whose sole name blisters our tongues, was once thought honest. You have loved him well. He has not touched you yet. I am young. And something you may deserve of him through me. And wisdom, to offer up a poor, weak, innocent lamb to appease an angry god. I am not treacherous. But Macbeth is. A good and virtuous nature may recoil in an imperial charge. But I shall crave your pardon. That what you are, my thoughts cannot transpose. Angels are still bright, yet the brightest fell. Though all things foul would wear the brows of grace, yet grace must still look so. I have lost my hopes. Perchance even there where I did find my doubts. Why in that rawness left you wife and child? Those precious motives, those strong knots of love without leave taking. I pray you, let not my jealousies be your dishonors, but mine own safeties. You may be justly right, whatever I shall think. Bleed, bleed, poor country. Great tyranny, lay thou thy basis sure, for goodness dare not check thee. Wear thou thy wrongs, the title is afeard. Fare thee well, Lord. I would not be the villain thou thinkest for the whole space that's in the tyrant's grasp and the wide world to boot. Be not offended. I speak not in absolute fear of you. I think our country sinks beneath the yoke. It weeps, it bleeds, and each day a new gash is added to her wounds. I think with all there would be hands uplifted in my right. And here from gracious England have I offer of goodly thousands. Devilish Macbeth, by many such plots, has sought to win me into his power. And modest wisdom plucks me from over-credulous haste. What I am truly is thine and my poor country's command. Whither indeed, before thy here approach, old seaward with 10,000 warlike men, armed to a point, was setting forth. <laughs> now, we'll together. Comes good King Edward forth, I pray you. Aye, sir, there are a crew of wretched souls that stay his cure. At his touch, such sanctity hath given his hand. They presently amend. I thank you, doctor. What's the disease he means? Tis called the evil. A most miraculous work in this good king, which often, since my hearing mean in England, I have seen him do. How he solicits heaven himself best knows. But strangely visited people, the mere despair of surgery he cures. With this strange virtue, he hath the heavenly gift of prophecy. And sundry blessings hang about his throne that speak him full of grace. See who comes here. My countryman, yet I know him not. My ever gentle cousin, welcome hither. I know him now. Good God, be times remove the means that makes us strangers. Sir, amen. Stand Scotland where it did. Alas, poor country, almost afraid to know itself. It cannot be called our mother, but our grave where nothing but who knows nothing was once seen to smile, where sighs and groans and shrieks that rend the air are made not marked, where violent sorrow seems a modern ecstasy. 
The dead men now scarce asked for who meant good men's lives expired before the flowers and their caps dying or ere they sicken. What's the newest grief? That of an hour's age thus hissed the speaker. Every minute teems a new one. How does my wife? Why, well. And all my children? Well, too. The tyrant has not battered at their peace? No, no. They were at peace when I did leave them. But not a niggard of thy speech. How goes it? When I came hither to transport the tidings which I have heavily borne, there ran a rumor of many worthy fellows that were out, which is, to my belief, to be witness of rather. For in that I saw the tyrant's power afoot. Now is the time of help. Your eye in Scotland would create soldiers, make, make women fight to doff their dire distresses. Be it their comfort, we are coming thither. Gracious England hath lent us good seaward and 10,000 men. An older and better soldier, none than Christendom gives out. Would I could answer the like. But I have words that would be howled in the deserts there where hearing could not latch them. What concern they? The general cause? Or is it a fee grief due to some single breast? No mind that's honest, but in it shares some woe. Though the main part pertains to you alone. If it be mine, keep it not from me. Quickly let me have it. Let not your ears despise my tongue, which shall possess them with the heaviest sound that ever yet they heard. Huh. I guess at it. Your castle is surprised. Your wife and babes is savagely slaughtered. <sighs> to tell the manner of it would to add the death of you. Mercy of heaven. What man? Ne'er pull your hat upon your brow. Give sorrow words. The grief that does not speak whispers the overfraught heart and bids it break. My children, too? Wife, children, servants, all that could be found. And I must be from thence. My wife killed, too. I have said. Be comforted. Let's make us medicines of our great revenge to cure this deadly grief. She has no children. All my pretty ones? Did you say all? Oh, hell kite! All? What all my pretty chickens in their dam at one fell swoop? Disputed like a man. I shall do so. But I must also feel it as a man. I cannot but remember such things were that were most precious to me. Did heaven look on and would not take their part? Sinful Macduff, they were all struck for thee, not that I am. Not for their own demerits, but for mine, fell slaughter on their souls. Heaven rest them now. Be this the whetstone of your sword. Let grief convert to anger. Blunt not the heart. Enrage it. Oh, I could play the woman with mine eyes and braggart with my tongue. But, gentle heavens, cut short all intermission. Front to front, bring thou this fiend of Scotland and myself. Within my sword's length, set him. If he scape, heaven forgive him too. This tune goes manly. Come. Go we to the king. Our power is ready. Our lack is nothing but our leave. Macbeth is ripe for the shaking. And the powers above put on their instruments. Receive what cheer you may. The night is long that never finds the day. Two nights have I watched with you, and can still perceive no truth in your report. When was it she last walked? Since His Majesty went into the field, I have seen her rise from her bed, throw her nightgown upon her, unlock her closet, take forth paper, fold it, write on it, read it, afterwards seal it, and again return to bed, yet all this while in a most fast sleep. 
a great perturbation in nature, at once to receive the benefits of sleep and to do the effects of watching. In this slumbery agitation, besides her walking and other actual performances, what at any time have you heard her say? That, sir, which I would not report after her. You may to me, and it is most meet that you should. Neither to you nor anyone, having no witness to confirm my speech. Lo you, here she comes. This is her very guise and upon my life, fast asleep. Observe her, stand close. How came she by that light? Why, it stood by her. She has light by her continually. Tis her command. You see her eyes are open. Aye, but their sense is shut. What is it she does now? Look, how she rubs her hands. Tis an accustomed action with her to seem thus washing her hands. I have known her continue in this a quarter of an hour. Yet here's a spot. Hark, she speaks. I will set down what comes from her to satisfy my remembrance the more strongly. Out! Damn spot! Out, I say! One. Two. Why then? Tis time to do it. Hell is murky! Fie, my lord. Fie. A soldier and a feared. What need we fear who knows it? when none can call our power to account. Yet, who would have thought the old man to have had so much blood in him? <laughs> Do you mark that? Pain of fight had a wife. Where is she now? What? Will these hands ne'er be clean? No more of that, my lord. No more of that. You mar all with this starting. Go to, go to. You have known what you should not. She has spoke what she should not. I am sure of it. Heaven knows what she has known. Yet, is the smell of the blood still? All the perfumes of Arabia will not sweeten this little... What a sigh is there. The heart is sorely charged. I would not have such a heart in my bosom for the dignity of the whole body. Well, well, well. Pray God it be, sir. This disease is beyond my practice. Yet I have known those who have walked in their sleep to have died holily in their beds. Wash your hands. Get on your nightgown. I tell you yet again, Banquo's buried. He cannot come out of his grave. Even so. To bed. To bed. There's knocking at the gate. Come, 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 come. Give me your hand. What's done cannot be undone. To bed. To bed. To bed. Will she now to bed? Directly. Foul whisperings are abroad. Unnatural deeds do breed unnatural troubles. Infected minds to their deaf pillows will discharge their secrets. More needs she the divine than the physician. God, God forgive us all. Take good care of her. Remove from her the means of all annoyance, and still keep eyes on her. My mind she has mated, and amazed my sight. I think, but dare not speak. Good night, good doctor. Good night now.
The English power is near, led on by Malcolm, his uncle Seward, and Good Macduff. Revenge is burning them, for their dear causes would to the bleeding and grim alarm excite the mortified man. Near Burnham Wood shall we will meet them, for that where they're coming. Who knows if Donald may be with his brother? For certain. See there, I have a file of all of the gentry. There is Seaworth's son and many unrough youths who even to this day protest their first of manhood. What does the tyrant? Great Dunson and he strongly fortifies. Some say that he's mad, others that lesser hate him do call it valiant fury. But for certain he cannot buckle his distempered cause within the belt of rule. Now does he feel a secret murder sticking on his hands. Now minutely revolts the greatest faith breach. Those he commands move only in command, nothing in love. Now does he feel his title hang loose about him, the giant's robe upon a dwarfish thief. Well, march we on to give obedience where it is truly owed. Meet we the medicine of the sickly wheel, and with him pour we in our country's purge each drop of us. Or so, however much it takes to do the sovereign flower and drown the weeds. Make we our march to Burnham. Bring me no more reports. Let them fly all. Till Burnham would remove to Dunsinane, I cannot taint with fear. What's the boy Malcolm? Was he not born of woman? The spirits that know all mortal custom have pronounced me thus. Fear not, Macbeth, for no man that's born of woman shall e'er have power upon thee. If so, then fly false thanes and mingle with the English epicures. The mind I sway by and the heart I bear shall never sag with doubt nor shake with fear. The devil damn thee black, thou cream-faced loon. Where gotst thou that goose look? There's ten thousand. Geese, villain. Soldiers, sir. Go, prick thy face and overread thy thumbs, thou lily-livered boy. What soldiers, patch? Death of thy soul, those linen cheeks of thine are counselors of fear. What soldiers weigh face? The English force, so please you. Take thy face hence. Satan! I'm sick at heart when I behold. Satan, I say! This push will cheer me ever or deceit me now. I've lived long enough. My way of life has fallen into the sear, the yellow leaf. And that which should accompany old age as honor, love, obedience, troops of friends I must not look to have, but in their stead curses, not loud, but deep mouth, honor, breath, which the pale heart must fain deny, but dares not. Satan! What's your gracious pleasure? What news more? All is confirmed, my lord, which was reported. I will fight till from my bones my flesh be hacked. Give me mine armor. Tis not needed yet. I will put it on. Go, send out more horses, scur the country round, and hang those that talk of fear. Give me mine armor. How does your patient, doctor? Uh, not so sick, my lord, as she is troubled with thick coming fancies that keep her from her rest. Cure her of that. Canst thou not minister to a mind diseased? Pluck from the memory a rooted sorrow, raise out the written troubles of the brain, and with some sweet oblivious antidote cleanse the stuffed bosom of that terrible stuff which weighs upon the heart? Therein the patient must minister to himself. Throw physic to the dogs. Oh, none of it. Come, bring me my armor. Satan, send out. Doctor, my things fly from me. Come, sir, dispatch. If thou couldst, doctor, send out the water of my land, bind her disease, and purge it to a sound and pristine health. If thou couldst, I would applaud thee to the very end, an echo which should applaud thee again. What? Rhubarb, what purgative drug could scour these English hints? Hearst thou of them? I, my good lord, your royal preparations make us hear of something. Bring it after me. I will not be afraid of death and bane till so Burnham Forest come to Dunsinane.
Were I from Dunsinane, away and clear, profit again should hardly draw me here. Cousins, I hope the days are here and the chamber shall be safe. We doubt it nothing. What wood is this before us? The wood of Burnham. Let every soldier hew him down a bow and bear it before him. Thereby shall we shadow the numbers of our hosts to make discovery air and report of us. It shall be done. We learn no other but the confident tyrant from still in Donsonane and will endure our setting down before it. Tis his main hope. For where there's advantage to be given, both more or less have given him the revolt. And none serve with him but constrained things, whose hearts are absent too. Let our just censures attend the true event, and put we on industry of soldiership. The time approaches that will with due decision make us know what we shall say we have and, and what we owe. Well, it's not speculative, their unsure hopes relate. But certain issue, strokes must arbitrate. Towards which, advance the war. Hang out our banner on the outward wall. The cry is still, they come. Our castle's strength will laugh a siege to scorn. Here let them lie till famine and the egg you eat them up. Were they not forced with those that should be ours, we might have met them, dareful, beard to beard, and beat them backward home. What is that noise? It is a cry of women, my good lord. I had almost forgot the taste of fears. The time has been when my senses would have cooled to hear a night shriek, and my fell of hair would at a dismal treatise rouse and stir as life were in it. But I have supped full with horrors. Direness, familiar with my slaughterous thoughts, cannot once start me. Wherefore was that cry? The queen, my lord, is dead. She should have died hereafter. There would have been a time for such a word. Tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player who struts and frets his hour upon the stage. And it's heard no more. Tis a tale told by an idiot. For sound and fury signifying nothing. I comes to use thy tongue, thy story quickly. Gracious, my lord, I should report that which I say I saw, but not know how to do it. And say, sir. As I did stand my watch upon the hill, I looked toward Burnham. In an odd me thought, the wood began to move. Liar and slave! Let me enjoy your wrath if it be not so. Within this three mile, you may see it coming. I say, a moving grove. If thou speakst false, upon the next tree shalt thou hang alive till famine cling thee. If thy speech is sooth, I care not if thou dost for me as much. I pull in resolution, 
and begin to doubt the equivocation of the fiend that lies like truth. Fear not till Burnham would do come to Dunsinane. Now the wood comes to Dunsinane. Arm, arm and out. If this which he about just does appear, there is no flying heads nor daring here. I get to be weary of the sun and wish the estate of the world were now undone. Ring the alarm bell. Blow wind, come rack. At least we'll die with harness at our back. Now, near enough, your leafy screens throw down and show like those you are. You, worthy uncle, shall lead our first battle. Worthy Macduff and we shall take upon us what else remains to do, according to our order. Well, fare you well. Do we but find the tyrant's power tonight? Let us be beaten if we cannot fight. Make all our trumpets speak. Give them all breath, those clamorous harbingers of blood and death. They've tied me to the stake. I cannot fly. But bear-like, I will fight the course. What's he that was not born of woman? Such a one am I to fear or none. What is thy name? Thou be afraid to hear it. No. Oh, thou callest thyself a hotter name than any is in hell. My name's Macbeth. The devil himself cannot pronounce the title more hateful to my ear. No. Nor more fearful. Thou liest, abhorred tyrant. With my sword, I'll prove the lie thou speakest. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Thou wast born of woman! But swords I smile at, weapons laugh to scorn, brandished by those of woman born. That way the noise is. Tyrant! Show thy face. If thou beest slain and with no stroke of mine, my wife and children's ghosts will haunt me still. I cannot strike it, wretched kerns whose arms are hired to bear their staves. Either thou, Macbeth, or else my sword with an unbattered edge I sheathe again undeeded. There thou shouldst be. By this great clatter, one of greatest note seems bruited. Let me find him fortune. And more. Uh, this way, my lord. The castle's gently rendered. The tyrant's people on both sides do fight. The thanes do bravely in the war. This day almost it itself professes yours, and little is to do. We are met with foes that strike beside us. Enter, sir, the castle. Why should I die like a Roman on my own sword? Well, if I see lives, the gashes do better upon them. Turn, hound! Of all men else, I have avoided thee. But get thee back. My soul is too much charged with blood of thine already. I have no words. My voice is in my sword, thou bloodier villain than terms can give thee out. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
Thou losest labor! As easy mayest thou the intrenchant air with thy keen sword impress, as make me bleed. Let fall thy blade on vulnerable crests. I bear a charm in life, which must not yield to one of woman born. <laughs> Despair thy charm, and let the angel whom thou still hast served tell thee, Macduff was from his mother's womb untimely wrecked. Cursed be that tongue that tells me so. But it cowed my better part of man. Be these oh. juggling fiends no more believed that palter with us in a double sense. To keep the word of promise to our ear and break it to our hope, I will not fight with thee. Then yield thee, coward, and live to be the show and gaze of the time. We'll have thee, as our rarer monsters are, painted on a pole and under writ. Here may you see the tyrant. I will not yield to kiss the ground before young Malcolm's feet and be baited with the rabble's curse. Though Burnham would become to Dunsinane, and thou opposed being of no woman born, yet I will try the last. For my body I throw my warlike shield. Lay on Macduff, damned be he that first cries, hold enough! <laughs> I would have friendly miss but safer rides. Well, um, some must go off. But by these I see, so great a day as this was cheaply bought. Your job is missing. And your noble son. Your son, my lord, has paid a soldier's debt. He only lived but till he were a man. The which no sooner had his prowess confirmed in the unshrinking station where he fought, but like a man he died. Then he is dead. I and brought off the field. Your, your cause of sorrow must not be measured by his worth, for then it hath no end. Had he his hurts before? Aye, on the front. Why then, God's soldier be he. Had I as many sons as I have heirs, I could not wish him to a fairer death. And so his knell is knolled. He is worth more sorrow. And that I'll spend for him. He is worth no more. And, and so God be with him. Hail, king! For so thou art. Behold where stands the usurper's cursed head. The time is free. I see thee compassed with thy kingdom's pearl that speak my salutation in their minds, whose voices I desire aloud with mine. Hail, King of Scotland! Hail, Hail King, King of, of Scotland. Scotland! We shall not spend a large expense of time before we reckon with your several loves and make us even with you. My thanes and kinsmen, henceforth the Earl, the first that ever Scotland in such an honor name. What's would be planted newly with the time, as calling home our exiled friends abroad that fled the snares of watchful tyranny, producing the cruel ministers of this dead butcher and his fiend-like queen, thought by self and violent hands took off her life. This and what needful else that calls upon us, by the grace of grace, we will perform in measure time and place so, thanks to all, and to each one, whom we invite to see us crowned at Schoon's.